Space The Final Frontier Come with us as we explore and unravel the mysteries of what lies beyond our planet Earth. Strap yourself in. Get your spacesuits ready as we prepare for takeoff in T minus. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Inside Outer Space. Spacewalk. Imagine how astronauts float in space. That's exactly what spacewalks are. A spacewalk or extravehicular activity or EVA is the term used to describe any activities that astronauts undertake in space outside any spacecraft. Spacewalks are done for a variety of reasons which include conducting experiments in space, testing out new equipment, and conducting repairs on a spacecraft. The first person to do a spacewalk is the Russian cosmonaut, Alexei Leonov, which he did during March 18, 1965. The whole thing lasted 10 minutes. Meanwhile, the record for the most number of spacewalks is held by Russian astronaut Anatoly Solovyev. He's had a total of 16 spacewalks with a combined time of almost 82 hours. Of course, going on spacewalks requires tremendous preparation and training to be executed properly and safely. Astronauts on Earth start training for spacewalks by going swimming. Swimming is the closest thing to floating in space. Astronauts train in a large swimming pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab or NBL. This pool holds a really large amount of water, which is around 6.2 million gallons. The NBL is located near the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Another method of training for spacewalks involves virtual reality where space is simulated in a video game-like environment. This type of training involves a special helmet with screens on it and gloves that act as controllers. During the spacewalk, astronauts wear special spacesuits that allow them to breathe and provide protection and life support. Astronauts wear these space suits hours in advance before the spacewalk to prepare for pressurization and to introduce the body to breathing just pure oxygen. This is important as breathing only oxygen helps flush out nitrogen in the body. The presence of nitrogen during spacewalks creates gas bubbles that can cause pain in the body. This condition is called the bends because the pain is usually found in the joints of the body. As a side note, the same method of breathing in pure oxygen is also employed by scuba divers before going on dives to prevent the bends as well. Once the prep is done, astronauts exit the spacecraft through a special chamber called the airlock. The airlock has two doors that lock in air inside the spacecraft during entry and exit. Outside, astronauts are attached to safety tethers to make sure that they do not float off into space. The astronauts' tools are also attached via tether so they don't float away as well. The astronauts also have special jet thrusters in their suits, just like a small jetpack that can help maneuver astronauts in space with a flick of a joystick.
Sport Cloud. What could be beyond our solar system? That is one of the questions that astronomers are still trying to figure out. Today, let's talk about a region that is theorized to be located way beyond our solar system and the Kuiper Belt. Let's discuss the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a region that is theorized to be the source of icy objects and debris well beyond the Kuiper Belt. It is described as a large shell containing icy objects located somewhere at the outermost part of the solar system. The name of the Oort cloud comes from the name of astronomer Jan Oort, who was the first to suggest the existence of such a region in space. This was in response to a query, where do most comets come from? The Oort cloud is said to be spherical, consistent with the laws of gravity. It is theorized that the particles in the Oort cloud are remnants of the materials and debris that formed the Sun and the planets during the birth of the solar system. The most widely accepted theory is that the materials from the Oort cloud formed part of the Sun at an earlier point in time. As the other planets formed and grew, these particles were pushed further away from the Sun as a result of the change in the gravitational influence of the solar system when the planets formed. It is also said that icy particles in the Oort cloud are easily disrupted by interstellar events such as the passing of a star, nebula, or an activity in the Milky Way. These activities tend to knock the icy material off the Oort cloud, sending them towards the Sun as comets. According to computations, the Oort cloud is probably located some 2,000 astronomical units from the Sun. Note that an AU is the distance of the Earth to the Sun. That's 149,598,000 kilometers or 93 million miles. It is estimated that there is around 2 trillion objects in the Oort cloud. In 2003, the planet Sedna was discovered and is thought to be part of the inner Oort cloud. Though still theoretical at this point, scientists continue to work on finding out what is beyond the solar system. Perhaps in the future, we can finally send space missions to verify the existence of the Oort cloud. Mercury the closest planet to the Sun, coming in with a diameter of 4,879 kilometers or 3,031.6 miles and a mass of 3.30 times 10 to the 23rd power kilogram or 7.242 times 10 to the 23rd power pounds with zero moons and an orbit period of 88 days with a varying temperature of approximately negative 173 degrees Celsius to 427 degrees Celsius or negative 279 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It is our nearby neighbor and is the smallest planet in the solar system. Welcome to Mercury. 
Mercury was first discovered by Assyrian astronomers in the early 14th century BC. It is the smallest planet in the solar system and is one of the five planets that is visible to the naked eye. Compared to Earth's size, Mercury only comes across at approximately 4,879 kilometers across the equator, whereas the Earth measures 12,742 kilometers or 7,917.5 miles. Despite being smaller than Earth, however, Mercury is denser than the Earth. This is because Mercury is composed mainly of rock and metal. The planet has a molten core, which scientists suspect is composed of sulfur. Despite being the closest to the Sun, Mercury is only the second hottest planet in the solar system, next to Venus. The surface of the planet is covered in craters that are caused by many impacts with asteroids and comets. To date, there have been only two spacecrafts that have visited Mercury. This is because having a close proximity to the Sun makes Mercury especially harder to travel to. Mariner 10 was the first to fly by Mercury between 1974 to 1975. Then, in 2004, the Messenger probe became the second to visit the planet after almost 30 years. Back to the space station, or spacecraft if separated. Star Chart Did you know that many ancient civilizations relied on the stars for navigation? They used what was called a star chart or star map. A star chart or star map is a map of the position of stars in the night sky. They are usually divided into grids to make navigation and management easier for travelers. The star charts use stars and other visible heavenly bodies as reference points for location and navigation. A great example reference point is the Northern Star or Polaris used as a reference to the direction of north. Because of the close proximity of the position of Polaris to the North Celestial Pole, star charts have been around since ancient times and nobody is really sure when people started using them. One of the oldest surviving star charts is a 32,500-year-old mammoth dust carving that was discovered in Germany in 1979. The carving on the tusk resembled the constellation of Orion. Another early example of a star chart can be found in a cave drawing in the Lascaux Caves of France. The Nebra Sky Disk, on the other hand, is a wide bronze disk dating back to 1600 BC and contains a star chart with the moon the sun and stars. As time went on, human civilization and knowledge has progressed to a point where ancient astronomers developed the ability to plot more accurate star charts. One of the earliest accurate star charts dates back to 1534 BC in Egypt. The Babylonians also have their own star charts dating back to 1531 BC. Elsewhere, Chinese astronomers have been keeping records of star positions as early as 476 BC. Star charts have been very instrumental during the period known as the Age of Discovery, a period in between the 15th to 18th century. In European history, characterized by extensive overseas exploration and expansion. The age of exploration was arguably the beginning of globalization through trade, exploration, mercantilism, and colonialism. 
the most widely used star charts of the time came from the records of Peter Dirkzoon Kaiser and Frederick de Houtman, two Dutch sailors who traveled to the Dutch East Indies. Another widely used reference was the Oranometria by Johan Baer, which was produced in 1603. Today, GPS and smartphone technology is breathing new life into the use of star charts. Apps and programs are available to anyone who wishes to use star charts for navigation. There are even augmented reality apps that overlay star chart data with current terrain and map data to show users exactly where they are under the stars. Is Pluto a planet? Well, our younger viewers might have not known this, but Pluto was once considered as a full-fledged planet as late as the mid-2000s. But all of this is changed now. So, let's talk about Pluto. Is it a planet? Well, the short answer is no. Let's go back a couple of years in time. Pluto was first discovered in 1930 by an American astronomer named Clyde Tombow with the help of the Lowell Observatory in Arizona, officially making Pluto as the ninth planet. This classification of Pluto was upheld till the early 2000s. So, what's changed? In the following decades since its discovery, better telescopes and interplanetary space missions helped identify the Kuiper Belt a region in space beyond the planet Neptune. The Kuiper Belt contained space debris, asteroids, and dwarf planets, which were still in orbit with the Sun. In 1992, the first Kuiper Belt object, or KBO, was identified as a 1992 QBI. It was detected by David Hewitt from the University of Hawaii. The discovery of the first KBO sparked debates on whether to reclassify Pluto because of its size. Further discoveries of the newer KBOs that are roughly the size or bigger than Pluto pushed the debate for reclassification even further. Finally, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union convened and set up a committee to discuss reclassifying Pluto as a dwarf planet. So what's Pluto like? Pluto is smaller compared to the other planets of the solar system. Its width is only half as large as the width of the whole of the United States, and the whole dwarf planet is smaller than our moon. A year on Pluto is roughly equivalent to 248 Earth years, and a day is about six and a half Earth days. Pluto has a very cold temperature because of its distance from the Sun. It also has less gravity because of its smaller mass. The New Horizons spacecraft was the first to take flyby images of Pluto in 2015. And that was another interstellar trip across the universe. Remember to join us next time for another mission to the cosmos and beyond. Only on Inside Outer Space